Hello and welcome to Sparda Aligned, your one-stop destination for the civil services preparation, UPSC, KPSC and other relevant examinations. Today we have picked up some of the important articles that are very relevant for your examination point of view in terms of GS Paper 1, GS Paper 2 and GS Paper 3. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article here speaks about Israeli airstrikes bound Gaza as death toll climbs. We have another article which speaks about the very same incident as well. We have taken both these articles together and we have gelled it as one single issue. Let's understand what this topic is in greater detail. However, we will also come up with another video which will focus entirely on this issue about who are the Hamas, what is the issue between Israel and Palestine, what could be the likely consequences of this debacle, what is this war all about. We will come up with a, a detailed video about the same but however we will restrict ourselves to this editorial in our today's discussion the first important factor that we have to understand is who are the hamas hamas is the largest palestinian militant group and one of the two major political parties in the region in which region in the region of palestine when we look into the Palestine, we have two important regions. One happens to be the West Bank, the other happens to be the Gaza Strip. So within Palestine, you have one of the political parties which is controlling the West Bank. You have Gaza Strip which is being currently controlled by the Hamas. This Hamas happens to be one of the militant organization which is operating and controlling the Gaza Strip. So when we speak about Palestine, there are two parts. One happens to be the West Bank which is controlled by one of the political organizations. The other part which exists is called as the Gaza Strip. It is this Gaza Strip which is controlled by the Hamas. Currently, it governs more than 2 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. The organization is also known for its armed resistance against Israel. Hamas as a whole or in some cases is also designated as a terrorist group by Israel, United States, European Union, United Kingdom and other countries. Whenever we speak about these organizations, one of the organizations may be an organization which is working for a freedom from one perception. But the same organization can also be declared as a terrorist organization by another group of countries as well. For example, for the cause of Palestine and for the cause of Gaza City, what these people are doing, that is this Israeli what this Hamas as a militant organization is doing is it is fighting for the freedom. So for the sake of Palestinians, it happens to be an organization which wants to liberate people from the hegemony of Israel. This is one perspective. The other perspective is since it is fighting against Israel, for Israel it happens to be a terrorist organization militant group. So according to Israel, United States, European Union, United Kingdom and other countries, this Hamas happens to be a terrorist organization. But for the people of Palestine, it happens to be a group which wants to liberate them from the hegemony of Israel. So who is Hamas? Hamas happens to be the last largest militant group and happens to be governing this strip of Palestine which happens to be Gaza Strip. Why are we discussing about the Hamas? That is because recently we have had a war that is being undertaken between Israel as well as Palestine. Why? That is because all of a sudden, suddenly you have these Hamas which happens to be a militant organization which started firing rockets into Israel and Israel has a country has to protect itself. So it started protecting itself and this is where there was a major clash between the Hamas as well as Israel. That is why we have this particular topic. Now the question is how did Hamas as an organization originate? The group was founded in the late 1980s after the beginning of the first Palestinian intifada or uprising against Israel occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The Jewish state had captured the two Palestinian territories after winning the 1967 as Israeli Arab war. So in 1967, we had the Israel-Arab war. All the Arabian countries had come together. They wanted to overthrow this Jewish country of Israel. So they had Israel who was fighting the lone battle. When all these countries were overpowered by Israel, they won this pocket of Palestine and ultimately after after the second world war when major jew countries where major jews from different countries of the world 
came up to this particular region and they formed Israel. But many Arab countries did not like it. So they went on a war. This is called as the first Palestinian Intifada or this is called as the uprising. Uprising of what? Uprising of all these Arab countries and Palestinians who were living in Palestine. They felt that the Israel as a country was taking over their country and their pockets of their country. But what Israel feels is that we are the Jewish country. Originally, we were present in this part, but we were overthrown by a couple of powers of late. So this became a fight between the Palestinian as well as the Israeli forces. So for the very first time, when the Palestinian forces were thrown out and you had the reinstatement of Israel happened in the 1967 Israeli Arab war. So the first time where the Palestinian and the Israelis fought against each other is called as the first Palestinian Intifada or this is also called as uprising. So the group was founded in the 1980s after this first Intifada primarily because they wanted to safeguard the rights of the Palestinians in Gaza Strip as well as in the West Jerusalem. But the point that needs to, that is Gaza Strip as well as the West Bank. So the point here is that you had two powers who were controlling Palestine. That is on the West you have what is called as a Gaza Strip. After that they started controlling that is the Hamas started controlling the this part which is called as the Gaza Strip on the right side what you have is called as the West Bank which was being protected and safeguarded by another political organization. Hamas is essentially the internal metamorphosis of the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood which was established in Jerusalem in 1946 according to the book Hamas a beginner's guide by Khalid al morab professor of Middle East studies at Northwestern University of Qatar. The main reason for Hamas creation was a deep sense of failure that had been set up within the Palestinian national movement by the late 1980s. The primarily happened because the Palestinian liberation organization involved in the armed struggle against Israel from 1960s to liberate Palestine made two massive concessions. As we discussed, we have what is called as the West Bank and we also have what is called as the Gaza Strip. So, because of the failure of the Palestinian liberation organization, they were not able to liberate Palestine from the hegemony of Israel according to their viewpoint. And as a result, what do they do? They felt that this Palestinian liberation organization or the PLO is not able to hack act against the hegemony of this particular country of Israel. So they wanted to liberate Palestine and as a result they felt that peaceful talks did not work, negotiations did not work, consensus did not work and many other countries started to help these countries that did not work. When nothing of this sort did not work, what they wanted to do was bring up their own fold of violent acts or what is called as a pragmatic viewpoint according to the Hamas and ultimately wanted to clear this entire debacle by taking arms against Israel. And as a result, from 1948 up until 1980s, the talks did not work, the consensus did not work and in fact, you also have the Palestine Liberation Organization as well which also started entering into negotiations and ultimately they also said that Israel as a country has the right to exist. On one side, the viewpoint of the Hamas was different. Hamas felt that Palestine as a country was existing and these people entered into Palestine. They have taken certain pockets of the country of Palestine. So it felt complete elimination of Israel was required. That is, these people will have to move elsewhere and this country should actually move over over because there was Palestine which only existed at that particular moment. So what they felt was that Palestine as a country was pre-existing even prior to the Second World War. Whatever was the original area, the same has to be kept up by Palestine. That was the viewpoint of the Hamas. But over a period of time, since Israel was able to capture a large swathe of land, the PLO entered into a compromise. It also recognized the Israel's right to exist thereby relinquishing its goal of liberating Palestine completely. So the PLO had compromised because it felt that after the World War II, new countries were created. Many countries came over from the hangs of the colonialism. So many Jews were also terminated in many of the countries as well. They also required one of the homes to be present and that happened to be Israel. 
so they felt that these jews who are present in israel also have the right to live so there was a compromise that they attained with the plo so israel entered into a compromise plo entered into a compromise and it recognized that israel has the right to live they have the people of israel have the right to live so this original intent where hamas felt israel will have to be completely eliminated its people have to be thrown into a different country to the viewpoint that plo so it said that there is a right for israel to exist and at the same time the plo also dropped the armed struggle as a strategy for the sake of a negotiated settlement they said that they'll not take up arms there'll be no war ed- against each other there'll be no violence whatsoever this was again in conflict with the hamas who felt that if there is need for us to exist in jerusalem in palestine these people will have to be thrown away by the armed struggle so on one side you had plo which wanted to bring an consensus and they wanted to ensure that there is no war no violence but then on the other side hamas which is currently present in the gaza strip wanted to overpower overthrow all the sections of the people of israel on the basis of a war so this is the history behind hamas and now what this article currently goes on to say is that this article currently says that from the military perspective as of now they may have launched the attack on israel but then this may not sustain for a very long period of time that is primarily because israel is far superior when it comes to its idea of military advancement so this article goes on to say that israel is expected to prevail and push back the hamas which lack resources to sustain the campaign and at the same time the unsavory experiences from adject intelligence failure to misplaced reliance on high tech missile defense and artificial intelligence could compel israel to revise its strategic or doctrines what do we understand by this what we have is israel israel has a country is very advanced when it comes to science and technology as well as defense so it will be able to cut initially it may have taken a back seat but over a period of time because it has money at its disposal it also has technology at its disposal hamas would not able to sustain this particular offense and defense strategy and it is israel which is going to eventually may win this war that is one point the second point is israel will also rethink about its security doctrine why that is because when you look into this entire crisis and the saga what has happened you had the failure from the intelligence agencies had the intelligence agencies knew about it this issue could not have surfaced but because there is a failure of the intelligence israel will have to rework on its entire strategy added to it as of now what are they basing their defense module on it is on the basis of artificial intelligence as well as high tech missile technology this has not worked primarily because there are intelligence failures so the author says there'll be an entire revamp of this structure when it comes to the israel security doctrine first point the second point is there are two ways of looking at it the two ways of looking at it is we have hamas which has now rocketed and it has impounded or you can say it has constantly bombarded or it has constantly hit israel with the rockets this at the same time also means there are a couple of other groups as well which are also wanting to pride on some fundamentalism let's say for example you have now some of the non arab militant groups such as hamas you also have islamic jihad you have hezbollah al houthis islamic state these groups may also start supporting them as well we don't know whether they'll support or not but the author says that because the hamas has taken an initiative of securing a certain pocket of palestine as a group with common objective of reinforcing the original palestine they may come together and this could also snowball into a major controversy that's the second issue however the also the author also goes on to say that it is only few groups which are supporting this organization for example many countries are not supporting them it is only qatar which is supporting them so whenever there is this offensive strategy that comes into picture what you require is the constant financing that comes into the picture israel has already entered into abraham accords with united arab emirates so they are in friendly relationship as of now you also have united states of america which is also in talks with saudi arabia as well and saudi arabia also may not fund as well 
originally in the 1967 uh, when the first infitada or the liberation movement started the uprising started all these countries had funded the hamas and certain other countries had also funded as well now it is only qatar which is supporting these hamas so this force or this financial power may not be present with the hamas and they may suffer says this article so primarily when you look at the original intention the original intention was to capture this that is under the control of israel but that may not work says the author why that is because of all these reasons one is because they do not have enough funding they do not have enough forces that support them and at the same time the international community may also stop them as well and that is the primary reason this may stop However, when it comes to India, what does the author say? India is not directly affected by this Tufan al-Raqsa, but it would nevertheless feel some heat. That is because this could have significant damages. India should balance both the viewpoints of the Palestine as well as Israel as well. And at the same time, India has taken a couple of initiatives. For example, recently we did have the India Middle East East Europe Economic Corridor. And in the past, we have also entered into I2U2 constructs as well. This basically means that India already has taken enough of economic measures. This momentarily or provisionally could have a suspension. Added to it, there are Indian diaspora who are also present in all these pockets these people are engaging in business activities these people will also get impacted so india though not directly involved in it but will also face significant heat how it navigates it how it opens up other areas of negotiation is what we have to wait and watch but in all likelihood india will stay neutral and will wait and watch to see what action it can take or what wordings it can release in the near future it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. Now let's look into the next article. This article says Digital India Act. What is this article all about? We have the Information Technology Act. What is this Information Technology Act? Whenever we speak about cyber fraud or we speak about cyber security or we speak about cyber warfare or we speak about privacy related to the cyber domain which is one area or one act that we focus on it is the information technology act let me give you an example we have one of the sections in the uh, information technology act which is section 43 and this has to be read with section 66 and this also has another section which is section 66 e which deals with identity theft what is the section 43 let's say for example there is a computer network what is this computer network let's say there is an organization let's say infosys or let's say for example zomato or let's say for example swiggy or any net any organization for that matter they have a group of computers or there is a large set of computers these computer networks are controlled by a network what if this particular network is hacked or what if there is a denial of service engaged to this particular network that is under the control of a company what if there is a hacker who enters into this particular network disturbs the network there is denial of service in that particular network distributed denial of service in that particular network or there is a virus or a worm worm that is added into this particular network that this entire system gets crashed or what if there is a virus that is added the confidentiality breach happens privacy of the individual takes into picture or there is a data resource or repository of data within this particular network in the server what if they steal the server's data all this is covered under this IT Act of 2000. So whenever we speak about hacking, whenever we speak about privacy related issue, whenever we speak about network and other things, that is what is coming under the IT Act. So when we speak about section 66C, it also speaks about identity theft. What is this identity theft? I'm acting as some other person, I'm impersonating some other person or I'm stealing away this information and I'm giving out this information in open that comes under this very concept of identity theft under section 66C of the IT Act. 
but when we speak about IT Act, when was it designed? When did it come into implementation? It was in the year 2000. What does this mean? This was designed when internet was still in the building process, when internet was not full fledged like how we have it today. So it was in the baby, it was taking baby steps and it was very in a nascent state. So as and when it has develop over a period of time there are a couple of issues that has surfaced as well let's say for example we are speaking about artificial intelligence or let's say for example we are speaking about cryptocurrencies or we are speaking about how this blockchain as a technology work all this was not covered under the original information technology act and the information technology of late has developed so fast and it requires new changes that has to be introduced as well in order to upkeep with the changing technology in order to make sure that we revamp this entire structure what we require is new law why because to meet the modern day exigencies urgencies and emergencies what we require is changing laws as well so in line with it what we have is a proposal made by the government of india in the form of the digital india act so this digital india act is a move by the Ministry of Electronics and Information where it will replace the Information Technology Act. Yes, we've had the Information Technology Act which is able to keep up to all the existing laws with respect to the cyber security as well as other areas of the cyber front. But now since it was developed in 2000, now we are in 2023. It's been more than a decade and what we require is this change that has to be brought into picture primarily because the IT Act happens to be a older version. So what is this DIA basically? Basically it places a strong emphasis on the online safety and trust. These are some of the important provisions with a commitment to safeguarding citizens right in the digital realm with remaining adaptable to the shifting market dynamics and international legal principles. So the first objective of this DIA or Digital India Act is to safeguard the rights of the people. Who are the people? We are the people. And then you also have companies and individuals. So when you say that it is wanting to protect the people, it includes the corporations, it includes the companies, it also includes the individuals as well. So safeguarding the rights of the individuals as well as corporations as well as entities is the first key objective of DIA. The second is with respect to the artificial intelligence and blockchain. It recognizes the importance of new age technologies such as artificial intelligence and blockchain and through this it aims to not only increase the adoption of these technologies but also ensure deployment so when you look at the original IT Act it did not envisage something of this level the artificial intelligence was not spoken of the cryptocurrencies were not spoken of the decentralized systems were not spoken of and now what we have is these new technologies to give boost to these technologies and also protect them what we require is new set of laws and provision which is what it is taking into picture third it upholds the concept of an open internet striking a balance between accessibility and necessary regulations to maintain order and protect the users additionally the dia mandates stringent know your customer requirements for wearable designers and at the same time, it will also impose criminal penal provisions as well. On one side, it speaks about open internet and at the other same, at the same time, it also validates this concept. While you have open internet, you would be able to use it. This also has to be regulated. So know your customer and maintaining public order issues is the need of the R, which will be taken into custody by the Digital India Act. And lastly, it will also take a relook into the safe harbor principle. What is the safe harbor principle? Let me give you an explanation. Let's say we have YouTube or let's say for example we have Facebook or let's say for example we have Instagram or let's say for example we have Twitter. These are the social media platforms that we currently have. What is the safe harbor principle? Let's say I as an individual am putting out a thought on YouTube or I'm putting a wordings or I'm recording a video on Facebook or I'm recording a reel on Instagram. If I am some, saying something which could lead to law and order problem issue, who is responsible for it? Is it Facebook or Instagram or YouTube which is hosting this video or the person who stole that particular wordings in that video or has written something about it? So the safe harbor principle goes on to say, despite hosting this video on its platform, it is the person who has recorded that video or written that article who will ultimately be liable for the wordings and for the reel or for the video. So the safe harbor principle will not put any onus on Facebook 
और YouTube और Instagram, but instead the entire responsibility will fall on that particular individual whosoever has recorded the video or uploaded the reel or written an article. So basically, when we speak about safe harbor principle, it says that this entire social organism, that is the social media organization, will take will not take the responsibility, but it is the individual who will take the responsibility for the content that he has delivered. So the government is planning to bring changes to this as well when it comes to the safe harbor principle where certain amount of responsibility will also be given to the social media companies but this could face couple of challenges as well what are these challenges as we just discussed one of the major issues is to do with the safe harbor principle as of now entire onus and responsibility is with the individual or whosoever is delivering the content but now there are planning to bring changes to the safe harbor principle which means that even those people who are not responsible for this content for example facebook instagram youtube they can also be held culpable which means there will be stricter regulations for these organizations and as a result many other companies will now think about this law and ultimately this will have stricter regulations and possibly these companies may not like it this will significantly have impact on the finances of these companies and at the same time they have to upkeep to the law and order they will have to employ more law officers as well as advocate and as a result this could impact innovation and ease of doing business and ultimately these people could suffer as well this also hinges on the effective enforcement which will require substantial resources expertise and infrastructure and balancing the various stakeholders while ensuring the protection of the citizens could also pose a significant challenge to the Digital India Act. So we have to see how exactly it is going to reshape but as of now these are some of the fundamentals that are covered under the Digital India Act. Now let's look into the next article. This article here is important from your GS Paper 3 Defense and it is also important from your preliminary examination point of view. What is this article? The Chief of Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Vivek Ram Chaudhary unveiled a new insignia for the Air Force as it marked the 91st anniversary. What is this insignia? This happens to be the symbol, this happens to be a sign, this happens to be the way how Air Force is shown. So the change is by inclusion of the Air Force crust. This happens to be the Air Force crust at the top. So it is at the top of the flag and at the same time you will also have is the Indian flag and you will also have is the symbol. So insignia is nothing but the symbol, the sign that we have. In a first scaling up of the degree of difficulty by a couple of notches, this helicopter displayed a four helicopter to a five helicopter display team. So this insignia is a statement that IAF crust has the national symbol, the Ashoka lion on the top and the Satyameva Jayate in Devanagiri below it. Below the Ashokan lion is a Himalayan eagle with its wing spread denoting the fighting qualities of the IAF. So this also has the word Bharatiya Vayu Sena and the motto of INF inscribed below Himalayan eagle in the golden Devanagiri. These are some of the wordings that you will have to know from the preliminary examination point of view. Now let's look into the next article. This article here is speaking about Dole. Dole, also called as the scientific name Sean Alfinus, is a candidate native to the Central, Southeast and Southeast Asia. Other English names for the species include Asian Wild Dog, Asiatic Wild Dog, Indian Wild Dog, Whistling Dog, Red Dog, Red Wolf and the Mountain Wolf. And from the preliminary examination point of view, we have three important factors that you have to remember. Which are these three important factors? One is the IUCN status, which is endangered. Then when it comes to the CITES, it is in Appendix 2. And from the Wildlife Protection Act, it is present under Schedule 2. And what are the threats that these species face? One of the major threats happens to be the habitat loss. So what is this habitat loss? Let's say for example, all those areas that they were living is currently under the control of the human beings. So there is agricultural related activity, there is infrastructure related activity like railway line and roads and there is also industrial outfits that are coming into the picture. This has resulted in significant loss of the environment as well as their habitat. This is the first major problem. 
the second is with respect to the prey base declining prey availability that is also because there is other species who are also looking for these prey for example you have the lions the tigers and other things which also are entering into a fight with these dolls and ultimately the prey base for example the deer population is decreasing that happens to be the major problem then there is persecution then there is diseases for the prey as well as for the species and then there is interspecific competition meanwhile there is livestock persecution and there is disease transfer from domestic to the feral dogs so these dogs that are present in the urban and the rural areas they also transfer the viruses to them and this disease burden is also a significant significant problem to these dolls and that has become a major threat to these species now let's look into the next article this article here is speaking again from the preliminary examination point of view and it speaks about pura kura kura lake in brazil so this pura kue kura happens to be a lake where is it it happens to be in the country of brazil which is very very important from your preliminary examination point of view now as you can see from the image it has become very dry and there is no water in this particular lake so this lake once upon a time was a very important lake for the agricultural activities it was a lake for fishing as well this was a lake for irrigation purposes this was a lake for drinking water this was a lake for many other human activities like washing and drinking as well now since it has become drier of late people are moving away from this particular area and what you can also see is internal migration as well so because there is internal migration because this particular lake is drying up people are moving away from this particular area so this is also once again due to the anthropogenic induced factors is what we have to understand with this article now let's look into the next article this article here is speaking about what is called as phonotaxis what is this phonotaxis these are the sounds made by the species for example scientists have said that the movement of an animal is response to a sound in case there is a frog that is making a particular sound or you have other species like the cricket which are also making a sound this could ultimately mean it is sending a signal to another species from the same very species there are two types of phonotaxis positive and negative the purpose of positive phonotaxis is attraction so whenever a sound is made by one of the species the male species is attracting the female species. species which means it usually happens when the females of a particular species including those of crickets and frogs are attracted to the sounds made by the males so it is the males who are attracting the females by these sounds and at the same time there is negative phonotaxis which serve to repel or warn such as when the sound of a predator nearby signals to an animal that it needs to move away so if there is a predator and this happens to be a prey so it is saying that don't come to this particular area why because there are predators in this particular place for example for the cricket it is the bat which happens to be the predator so there are bats in this particular locality don't come is the sign so on one side it is a sign phototaxis are nothing but the sound that is given by the species to the other species if it is the male species it is attracting the female species and if it is a sound that is given by these species it is also a warning not to come to this area or the region primarily because there is a predator there is an enemy and they can gobble us so these are nothing but the species specific sounds to attract the females or it can also be that don't come to this area because there is a predator it is this that we have to understand with respect to the photo taxis so this is it for today thank you for watching all the best